and you can see my screen now. Okay, very good. Um, good evening, everybody, and thank you for the invitation to participate in this uh, seminar. I have uh, sent to the secretariat of your uh, conference an extended technical presentation uh, because I will be going through a shorter version and uh, rather quickly. And of course, I have my email there in case you have any questions, I will be happy to uh, answer your, uh, your questions. My uh, presentation has uh, five parts. I will talk briefly about marine hydrokinetic energy the challenges that we face in harnessing this uh, hydrokinetic energy. Uh, then uh, the concept that we have developed in uh, the University of Michigan in the Marine Renewable Energy Laboratory. And if we have time, I will talk briefly about the research advances that we have made in order to be able to uh, build this device and uh, do lots of experiments and field tests. And finally, uh, very quick uh, comments on uh, the design uh, considerations of the Vivace converter. Uh, the word Vivace, first of all, you know, it's an Italian word and it's lively, but uh, it comes from vortex induced vibrations for aquatic clean energy, uh, which was the first, uh, very, very first concept back in 2005 but quickly we expanded it to flow-induced oscillations to include galloping and interaction between VIV and galloping and other phenomena. So let's talk briefly about marine hydrokinetic energy. Uh, you know that the, all our energy is coming from the sun. A big part of it is uh, reflected or radiated and a big amount is absorbed, about 89 petawatts. Most of it is absorbed by the oceans and you can compare this to the amount of energy that we have in winds and biomass, all of which, of course, are much higher than the world energy consumption. The big problem, of course, with ocean energy is that the mass vast majority of it is in form of thermal energy. And of course, thermal energy is a low form, low quality form of energy. It's not as high quality as chemical, uh, electrical or mechanical. Um, you know that we have, uh, as, uh, as uh, United Nations, we have uh, a goal of achieving neutrality by 2050, carbon neutrality. Of course, this is a very, very ambitious goal, and I am sure that it will be readjusted as we move along. And uh, if you look back in 2009, we had uh, uh, renewable energy 8%. Now in 2018, we have renewable energy of uh, 11%. So there has been a, a progress of about 3% in the, in the last decade, which is of course considerable progress, but slow. Hydrokinetic energy comes in two forms, in uh, horizontal, which you find in tides, ocean currents and rivers, or in uh, vertical form, which you primarily get in uh, waves, and you know that all around the world, we have tides, uh, we have ocean currents in all the big uh, oceans and even in uh, the Gulf of Mexico and smaller areas. And of course, every country has uh, lots of rivers, but of course, the speed of the flow is extremely important. You know that the power is proportional to the cube of the velocity. So when the velocity uh, is only half, of the nominal velocity that we need, then the amount of power goes down by a factor of eight. Uh, as an example, in the United States, uh, if you look at the available amount in tides, rivers, river currents, and ocean currents, you will see that there is some considerable difference between the theoretical one and the practical one. And by practical one, we mean what can we actually extract uh, from the uh, flow with the equipment that we have and the proximity to uh, shore and, and so on. So if you look at the tidal streams, probably it's, they're the easiest to harness. The theoretical is about 1.5 uh, quads per year. 
uh, and you can translate it here to terawatt hours per year, or, uh, and the practical is 1.1, from rivers and ocean currents, we have different numbers, of course. And the idea is how do we use this renewable energy in the blue economy? Because uh, the advantage that um, hydrokinetic energy has regarding the blue economy is that it is located, the energy, the source of the energy is located in the middle of uh, the ocean uh, where we have all these applications for the blue economy. And as you know, the blue economy is expected to reach like trillions of dollars, about three trillions of dollars in about 10 years. However, at this point, horizontal marine hydrokinetic energy remains largely untapped because we have many challenges. And the challenges, of course, come from sustainability. And how do we convert these challenges into design requirements? Uh, there are three, for, well, first of all, let's define sustainability. We are trying to avoid depletion of natural resources to maintain an ecological balance. And uh, basically we want to meet the needs of the present generation without compromising the needs of future generations. And the three pillars of sustainability translate to the three Ps, planet, profits, and people. Uh, of course, we need to respect the planet, but in probably lots of people's uh, minds, this is a farther out goal. Then we have people who, of course, we have to respect their properties. They, you know, when they are uh, on shore, uh, they are very expensive properties, and they have every right to be defensive of uh, their uh, property. But of course, without profit, you cannot drive uh, any anything. And we're talking ab about reducing the levelized cost of energy, which is the direct economic factor, uh, because unfortunately there are other economic factors like the damage we cause to the environment is kind of intangible. And until there are some penalties placed on uh, use of carbon or other uh, greenhouse uh, gases, the this hidden cost is not going to show up in the equation. Uh, the list of challenges, of course, is very high, and I have divided them here into categories. I will not go through each one of those. Environment, social, performance of the equipment, uh, durability, uh, design, and, of course, our objective is to reduce the levelized cost of energy and compete, if possible, with way cheaper uh, sources of energy, like carbon. I would like to spend a little bit more time primarily on the performance. Uh, we need to have, one of the requirements is to have low onset of speed. And the reason is that hydrokinetic turbines, according to EPRI, the Electrical Power Research Institute in California, require a minimum, uh, an average velocity rather between five and seven knots with a minimum of, uh, of four knots, two meters per second. But if you look at the vast majority of currents in the ocean, they are slower than three knots, 1.5 meters per second. And typically rivers are slower than two knots, one meter per second. The other requirement is how do we make um, the devices have low onset velocity. Specifically, you have a variable inflow, uh, inflow velocity, particularly if you have tides, if you have seasonal changes, or even uh, changes within uh, the tidal uh, range of 6 to 12 hours. And then we operate in, typically in turbulent environments. And when you have a turbulent environment, you know that if you have, for example, uh, a propeller, the angle of attack on the foil is going to change dramatically depending on the size of the turbulence, and that can take the maximum efficiency down to practically zero. Then the issue is, do we really have, can we live with a very highly tuned device, which is going to give you high efficiency at, at uh, 
some particular velocity or uh, RPM, or uh, do we need a much broader uh, range of high efficiency? Uh, the criterion for, uh, one of the criteria rather for performance of devices is the ratio of power to volume. In other words, out of the volume that you have occupied with your equipment, how much power can you extract? And this is the Achilles heel of all renewable energy technologies. Uh, to give you an idea, diesel engines have density of 25,000 watts per cubic meter. Wind farms of a hundredth of a watt per cubic meter. So we're talking about a ratio of 2.5 million. So typically for renewable devices, for renewable technology, all renewable energy technologies, you need a lot of space. The objective, of course, is to get low levelized cost of energy. And the numbers that I have here are from a study by the Department of Energy, uh, where presently the best values that we get are in a rivering system at a large scale, utility scale. The cost is about 17, uh, 17 cents per kilowatt uh, hour. Uh, if you go to a, a utility scale tidal stream, the cost is about 10 cents per kilowatt hour. In remote systems, you're going up to 21 and 25 uh, cents per kilowatt hour. But of course, these are the optimum numbers. Uh, if you go to some very distant locations like in Alaska or some other areas in the Caribbean, for example, where uh, there are no uh, resources, the cost can, go, can skyrocket way above these numbers. But if we are to compare what we have now in hydrokinetic energy with what the objectives are, we're talking about a reduction of about 60% in levelized cost of energy. And we need to meet that. And th this target as set by the Department of Energy is for 2030, that is in eight years. So let me talk now about our concept, uh, the Vivace converter, uh, which is based on instabilities and fish biomimetics. Uh, the idea here is to mimic fish cool dynamics without the complexity of fish cool kinematics. Of course, you know that fish, when it comes to movement in uh, water, are much smarter than we are. Uh, but their kinematics, of course, is very complex. Uh, if we are to build uh, devices that look like fish in order to take advantage of the vertical flows, those will have a lot of controls and a lot of maintenance issues. So the dynamics of fish, individual fish or in schools, uh, is based on vortex setting. On, I shouldn't say that, it's based on alternating uh, forces as opposed to steady force. So if you have a lifting surface and you have a steady inflow, then there's a steady lift perpendicular to the direction of the flow. When fish move or practically anything uh, moving in dense fluid, it moves with, uh, naturally, I'm talk not talking about propellers or airfoils, I'm talking about a natural way of moving in water, is with alternating uh, motion. And if you look at these two small pictures, this is a cylinder, and a cylinder is stationary in an incident flow. And what you have, uh, in uh, the wake is a thrust wake. In other words, if you are to be uh, present in that wake, it will push you forward compared to the outer flow. If you look at a fish moving forward velocity U, then of course you have the alternating uh, wake again, but now you have a drag wake because of course the fish is putting energy into the flow. But if you look at a formation in the diamond formation that you see in uh, fish uh, schools, what do you see here that the two leading fish, gray in color, they generate uh, a drag wake, each one of them generates a drag wake. But if you combine half of the drag wake from each uh, fish, 
then you see that you are creating a thrust wake, which is what uh, the blackfish is taking advantage of. And um, if you look at uh, a bluff body in a steady flow, the wake that it creates basically is a thrust wake. And there has been a, a study funded by the Department of Energy at Oak Ridge National Lab with, uh, in collaboration with Harvard and MIT. It, was, it ended about 10 years ago and it lasted for about 10 years. And it has shown that really fish thrive in the wake of cylinders because it's an alternating uh, flow, which is what fish use most. And so what the fish do, like these black fish, by slight undulation of its body, it moves between the vortices and it stays there and it relaxes and they spawn more and they don't get out of that uh, uh, benign environment for them, except for to grab some food and then get back. I will, uh, so in hydrodynamics, oops, sorry, in hydrodynamics, you know that we have fluid structure interaction and there are two phenomena that basically generate alternating uh, wakes. And one is vortex induced vibration and the other is galloping. Uh, and this happens with elongated bodies uh, that, uh, with elongated bodies that, uh, are flexible. Okay. All right. Uh, and if you if you look at the scale of this uh, phenomenon, which uh, of the wake that is of a cylinder, you can see that you have practically very similar uh, wakes, whether you are at a scale of one foot or a scale of five miles. And this is a picture, a NASA picture. Uh, of uh, clouds floating over an island and leaving an alternating wake of large von Karman vortices behind it. Uh. This actually was, it was the first model that we put together in 2005 when we had this idea. And what you can see is that you have pretty large oscillations we connect through a transmission system to a generator which lies about. Yeah. Now, uh, what uh, I would like to say here also is, I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah. What I would like to say here is that you have uh, a relatively complex phenomenon in vortex-induced vibration. I presume most of you have uh, seen, some of you may be very familiar with vortex-induced vibrations. Uh, they typically start with like a linear resonance system, but when they reach uh, a higher amplitude, we have a lock-in between the frequency of the body oscillation and the, and, and the frequency of vortex setting. And then it, it becomes nonlinear oscillation that lasts over a very broad range of synchronization, which is a great advantage. The thing I want to point out with this uh, figure here is that probably you have seen this graph from um, uh, Cornell University from Williamson. This is at low Reynolds numbers on the order of four to 10,000. And you have an initial branch, an upper branch, a lower branch and desynchronization. So the vortex induced vibrations last over this broad range. I am comparing this to the experiments that we do, which are in, uh, in higher Reynolds numbers, uh, up to about 300,000. And in that regime, the initial branch, uh, is climbs up fast, then you go to the upper branch, which overtakes the lower branch, and then you have desynchronization. In both cases, of course, you have smooth cylinders, but I want to point out this difference in the next figure. Uh, briefly, the experiments in the so-called TRSL2 flow regime, where we have the classical uh, results from Williamson, the lift coefficient is relatively low. 
And in the TRSL3 flow regime, the lift coefficient is much higher. That's why you see this difference in the response of uh, an oscillating cylinder. Uh, the, this flow regime where we operate is called TRSL3 flow regime, this one. And it stands for transition shear layer three. And the qualitative difference between these uh, various regimes is that in TRSL3, the shear layers are fully turbulent. So the vortices that roll up, roll up very close to the body, they're stronger. And as they shed and push away the cylinder, this uh, force is much closer to the body. That's why you observe this uh, lift coefficient, which is about 10 times higher than if you have, than if you are in the TRSL2 flow regime. Okay, so, um, then uh, let me talk briefly about galloping. Uh, galloping is a totally different phenomenon. It's an instability phenomenon. It is not, uh, and even though, as you see in this animation here, in galloping, we have vortex shedding, the vortices are not the ones driving the cylinder. The cylinder is driven by an instability. The, so that's one big difference between VIV and galloping. And the other one is that VIV is self-limiting. It reaches an amplitude and then it terminates. While galloping starts at certain velocity and does not end until the structure is, is destroyed. So what you see, for example, in this light blue one is VIV and galloping separated by this gap, which of course wouldn't be uh, good if you are trying to design a device to harness energy. But with turbulent stimulation, and you probably see these black stripes here on um, the cylinder, uh, you can initiate galloping early, you can bring galloping much earlier, and then you can have a response hybrid operator that looks like this. In other words, it starts before, a little before the natural frequency of uh, the oscillator and it never ends, which provides a very large uh, range of, of operation of such a system. Of course, if you are trying to suppress vortex-induced vibration, this is something that you have to avoid. I'm gonna skip this one. Let me show you another issue which uh, has to do with galloping. Uh, when we first started playing with the boundary layer and the shear layer in order to uh, find out the response of a cylinder, as you can see with this specific distribution of, uh, of, uh, of uh, roughness inside the boundary layer, we managed to suppress the IV. But if you push it, as you see in this uh, video, if you push it, then of course you go over a hump, it's a really hump, and then you turn a stage. Then the next issue that uh, we need to consider when we try to harness energy is what if you have multiple cylinders? One is in the wake of the other. And in uh, this uh, middle video here, we have two cylinders. And in this one, we have four cylinders. And it is possible actually, to, as I show you later, to be able to make the cylinders extract more energy when they work close together in synergy than when they are isolated and far apart. Uh, okay. Um, I think I have limited time, so I will skip this one, but this is a useful slide in case uh, you have time later to look at it. It talks about common property between cylinder schools and fish uh, schools. And it has to do with the alternating lift, how we extract energy versus fish, trying to put energy into the fluid and adjusting the frequency and adjusting the amplitude for uh, the cylinders. All right, so let's talk briefly about the four things that we are using if when we say that we use fish biomimetics and the first of all it's alternating lift because that's the way things move 
uh, in, the, in uh, the water. And if we manage to move with alternating lift, which is what we're doing with the Rivadza converter, then we really do not disturb the uh, fish uh, environment. The second one is enhancing instabilities, whether these instabilities are VIV instabilities or galloping instabilities. The most important one is synergy. You know that if you have two turbines in water, you will have to take them far apart, about 20 diameters apart, before you can have a clean flow for the turbine in uh, the wake of the first one. And on the contrary, in our case, as you have seen also with the uh, school of fish, we use the cylinders pretty close to each other, within half to one, one and a half diameter spacing. And then each one feeds off the other one. Even the, the leading cylinder benefits from the rear cylinder. That increases dramatically the power to volume ratio that I mentioned. Not only we get more energy by synergy of two cylinders or up to four cylinders, but also we reduce the space dramatically. Okay. And I will skip this one. All right. Let's talk about a little bit about the research advances um, that we have uh, made. This is a very complex problem. And like most complex problems in hydrodynamics uh, these days, we really have to use a lot of different complementary ways of addressing the problem. And of course, we have a very large or a large, I should say, water channel. It recirculates about uh, 30,000 gallons of water, 120,000 uh, liters. Uh, we have various oscillators. We're going up to four oscillators. Uh, we use um, visualization. We use computational fluid dynamics that we have developed in uh, my lab based on open foam. Then we use signal processing, the classical one of fast Fourier transform, but also uh, the Hilbert uh, Huang transform and empirical mode decomposition, uh, and the towing tank and field tests, because we, of course, we need to test the scale. And this is an analytical method that we developed about two, two, two and a half years ago, which uh, gives us an amazing accuracy in predicting uh, properties of the oscillating cylinder when in VIV and galloping, when we have only one cylinder though. Uh, let me say one other thing, an issue that we face with water propellers and uh, water turbines when we try to harness energy is uh, the speed of the tip. That is several times what you face is even cavitation of the tips of the propeller. So if you have like a, a device that harnesses energy um, and it's 20 meters in diameter, you the tips may go into cavitation and may go into uh, in, and cause noise. Uh, if you look at these experimental results that we have here, the cylinders that we have oscillate at maximum at 1.4 times the velocity of the flow. So there's an incident flow of one knot, let's say, then the cylinder will oscillate at maximum of 1.4 knots. And when you go to higher uh, velocities, actually to higher flow velocities, actually that ratio is even uh, lower. Okay. Um, these actually pictures are from uh, the device that you see in my virtual background, it's from uh, the field test that we did in the St. Clair River in 2016. And we captured lots of times fish in the wake, really enjoying the oscillatory uh, wake. Okay. Um, let me say something about the response amplitude operator because this, I believe, is important. The, you're all familiar with this one. We're all familiar with the linear oscillator, how it starts uh, before the natural frequency, and then it has very high response near the natural frequency, but it has a very narrow bandwidth. Then if you have low Reynolds numbers, we know that VIV has expanded uh, range 
but it's self-limiting. You go to the TRS of three flow regime, which are, um, to give you an idea, the cylinders that we have are about, uh, let's say, 10 centimeters in diameter, and the velocity goes up to a meter and a half. Those give you Reynolds number on the order of 150,000. That's where uh, we are. And if you go to a pipeline, which is about uh, 25 centimeters in diameter, you may get into transition of the boundary layer. So if you combine this flow regime that you have with the galloping in this picture that I've shown you earlier, and with proper turbulence stimulation, initiate galloping earlier, then what do you have? You have, you start with a linear oscillator, you reach the upper branch of VIV, which, expand, which expands here, and then you go into a transition between VIV and galloping, where both mechanisms coexist, and then you go into galloping. So you start at the velocity, let's say, of one uh, meter per second, and it continues, this large amplitude response continues forever as you increase the velocity. Um, this is part of the turbulence stimulation. I will not spend time on this. Uh, and these are from tests that we did in our Tony tank as we were trying at the beginning to find out how to design turbulence stimulation. And you can see what happens here as we started building the turbulence stimulation, we kept hitting the uh, boundaries of the, the limits of our facility. And eventually we started quite early. We managed to start galloping uh, right after the initial branch, at the beginning of the upper branch, but we never managed to start it even before uh, the natural frequency, okay. which is fine because each one I uh, will skip this on the turbulence stimulation. But what the only thing I want to say here is that we managed to get to extract energy starting at amplitude at velocities down to 0 0.19 meters per second. In other words, less than half a knot, which is amazing. Of course, the density, the power density is low at those low velocities, but even in such low uh, speed environments, you can harness energy. Uh, the thing that was most productive for us in research was the adaptive dumping. In other words, if you have high dumping in order to extract high energy, you may even separate VIV from galloping. You may get too much energy out of it. With adaptive dumping, you base, what you do basically is when you have a lot of speed in the cylinders, you harness more energy. When you do not have enough speed in the oscillating cylinders, you harness less energy by adjusting the damping. Yeah. Uh, skip that. Um, a, couple, a couple of years ago, maybe you remember in uh, the OMAE conference, I introduced for the first time this theory that we developed, which shows that the traditional equations that we use for vortex-induced vibrations actually lead to an eigenrelation. And this eigenrelation here is like the equivalent of what we have in the dispersion relation in waves. Certain properties have to be met and, and an equation has to be satisfied for VIV to occur. So we're using this now and it takes quite a bit of effort in the time domain to find out what residual forces we have past the classical linear theory in VIV. And in linear theory, of course, we get excellent prediction uh, between theory and experiments, which, uh, let's see, I'm going to skip this. Uh, anyway, uh, what, sorry, what I was trying to point out that is that we get excellent agreement between experiments and uh, theory for the first order, for order uh, forces. Yeah. Uh, this is synergy between two cylinders, and you can see uh, that it is possible to, to get the two cylinders to oscillate at very high amplitude, and then you apply dumping and you get significant energy out of it. I see that I'm running out of time. 
So let me speed up a little. Uh, in uh, research, probably the most challenging issue is how do you go backwards? In other words, how do you trigger the modes of interaction between the bodies in order to get a lot of energy? And in these uh, animations, if you have time to watch them in the extended presentation that I have uh, sent uh, to you, you have examples like this one here. As you will see, the cylinder starts oscillating with and both with high amplitude. And pretty quickly, you see that the vortices from the leading cylinder grab the vorticity from the second cylinder, reduce its circulation to zero, and basically dump its motion. And you have other scenarios where the cylinders may work almost independently, and other ones where the vorticity from the leading cylinder attaches to the second cylinder, increases its, uh, its circulation, and increases its amplitude. Very difficult phenomena, but we have, uh, I think we managed really, we haven't published it yet, we managed really to figure it out uh, how to trigger those modes, regardless of speed and spacing. I will skip this. This shows you how much more energy we get when we combine cylinders compared to isolated cylinders. And two or in actually in three cylinders. And we have worked it out with two, three, and uh, four cylinders. And this is what we get if we combine cylinders. Let me explain this uh, one here. Uh, this is uh, the non-dimensionalized power of one cylinder, two, three, and three, and four cylinders. What does that mean? It means that we take the power that we generate from one cylinder, we use it as one, we call it one, we divide by that basically the cases for two, three, and four cylinders. And you can see that with two cylinders, we can get uh, more than three times the amount of one cylinder, with four, three cylinders, you can go more than five, and with four cylinders, more than six. And this is how the efficiency changes and over a very broad range of synchronization. If you look down at the velocities here, with between like 0 0.8 and about 1.1, we achieve efficiency between 80 and 90%. Uh, some... Um, I, I will skip this one. You can understand that uh, both the VIV phenomenon and the galloping phenomenon are scalable, highly scalable, and therefore you can apply these to small devices from like one watt, you know, for uh, powering some equipment in expeditions all the way to megawatts, uh, depending on how much space you really want to use. And these are some of the design concepts that we have been uh, considering. And at the end, I would like you to just see this video, which is something that the University of Michigan put together for us. And it's about a minute. All right. Well, thank you very much. Muchas gracias for following my presentation again. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Baranitsas, for your excellent presentation. Very interesting, very uh, motivating for uh, for the for the people who, who likes hydrodynamics. This uh, VAV, this uh, galloping phenomena, which are not easier, not they, these are not easy to to deal with. But uh, you have uh, found a very interesting. Usually, we are trying to to avoid this phenomena, and you have find a way to take advantage of them. Uh, thank you very much. Of course, it will be a very valuable contribution to our students. And 
let's see if we have uh, questions. Yes, we have here uh, one question from Joseph. Say, if the system is used in the sea, is it likely to radically change the marine life? Um, that's a very interesting question. It's a question that all devices uh, face. Uh, and the, from the study that we had for, from the 10 year long study that we had from the Department of Energy, uh, fish take advantage of the wake of cylinders because it's the same nature of alternating uh, flow. So the, they've done a study where they put fish behind cylinders and the fish just didn't want to go away. They just stayed behind the bluff body and were riding the vortices and they spawned more. And um, it was basically right like a, an enjoyment park for the fish. So in that respect, uh, I think uh, it's not just a friendly uh, device, but we expect that fish are going to start accumulating behind uh, Vivacha converters and uh, enjoy the ride of the vortices. Well, thanks for your question. One, one more thing on that. Uh, one issue uh, that I mentioned during the uh, presentation was uh, people, of course, are afraid of uh, large propellers because they move fast. Uh, even their tips may go into galloping, into, into cavitation. But our cylinders, they move relatively slowly, 20 to 40% faster than the incident flow. So if you have a flow that is two meters per second, you, are ex you expect a transverse velocity of the cylinder of no more than 2.8 uh, uh, knots. Okay. Uh, let's see, we have another question. No. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you uh, showed that uh, there are some applications where you are using four cylinders. What about using uh, less or more cylinder than that and the distance between this cylinder do we have a, a, a number or a criteria for choosing this distance between this among these cylinders yes that's uh that's a a very difficult question but uh, let me answer one one part at a time the first thing is uh, the efficiency that i've shown you uh before in other words when you have instead of one cylinder two cylinders Absolutely, that's what you should do because you get a lot more uh, power. Uh, the two cylinders help each other. To answer your question, uh, well, let me go. To three cylinders, you also gain a lot. When you go from three to four, of course, it's diminishing uh, return. That is, uh, you know that there is the bets limit. And with, uh, for example, if you have three, limit, three cylinders, you, we reach about... Uh, 70, I have to see the numbers, I don't remember them exactly, about 70% of the bets limit. With four cylinders, you go up to 88% of the bets limit. Is it worth it? In other words, if you have the space, absolutely. Uh, you know, you use the cylinders in pairs or in triplets. Beyond the three, it starts getting probably more expensive. If you don't have the space though, then you can go to four cylinders and you reach the efficiency of 80 to 90% off the bets limit. To answer your other question about the, the spacing, um, and, I, and it's in my presentation, at some point uh, I have two cylinders and three cylinders. I have three slides, I showed you only one in each case where uh, we find the optimal spacing or the optimal stiffness. It really depends on the flow speed and the spacing of the cylinders, how vorticity is going to set from one vo cylinder and hit the second one. That what I was mentioning about uh, the vorticity uh, of the leading cylinder stealing the vorticity of the second cylinder, as opposed to attaching it to it and creating more circulation and lift. So it's a very difficult hydrodynamic problem. But um, recently we solved the problem <laughs> with adaptive dumping. In other words, in the controls, we adjust the dumping, how much energy we take out of the system based on the response of the system. 
And that we're doing experiments actually these days. Uh, we, and that way we managed to trigger modes. And in a paper that we published about, uh, about a month ago, uh, when the pattern of oscillation of the cylinders becomes similar to the undulation shape of a fish, you have maximum energy being shed. So you can think of the three or four cylinders in a pattern where they mimic the undulation of a fish. That's when you get maximum energy. And we managed to trigger this and we file for a patent. <laughs> we managed to trigger this uh, using adaptive dumping. So, and indeed it's a very, very complex problem. And if you ask me for the direct analysis, it's very difficult. I can show you all the cases or the various patterns when you get a lot of energy, when you don't. But the engineering issue is the more difficult one, of course. How do you trigger those modes? And I believe we're there. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a very, very, very interesting and complex topic to deal with. I, I know that you have years, more than 17 years working with this, uh, this project. I have followed some of your presentations in YouTube. Uh, very, very interesting, very, very self-explanatory your, your, your presentation. So for our students, I also invite you to see some of the presentations that uh, are available in the internet from Professor Barnitzas, where he explained in detail uh, many of the, the, physical, uh, the physics that are behind this uh, this phenomenon and the application in this uh, Vivashi uh, device. So uh, we don't have uh, more time to, to more questions. Then I will thank again Professor Bernitzas for your very nice, very interesting, very valuable presentation. And uh, hope to, to, to see you soon uh, here again with, with our students. And uh, thanks. Many, thank many you. thanks. Thank you. So uh, now we need to proceed with the next presentation. Uh, sorry, and I, I need to change to <laughs> Spanish. Uh, muchas gracias, Profesor Bernitzas, por la excelente presentación. Eh, mencionaba que algunos de en YouTube pueden encontrar varias presentaciones del Profesor Bernitzas donde, con explicaciones bastante pedagógicas sobre, sobre este fenómeno del VIB y del galloping y, y su aplicación en este tipo de absorbedor de, de energía hidrocinética. Eh, muchas gracias ahí por la atención de todos. Yo voy a dejar aquí el, la posta para el doctor Manco para que pueda seguir aquí con la conducción de nuestro décimo tercer eh, sindicato.